we have with us uh, none other than the legendary Dr. Stanley Kribner, who will present cross-cultural approaches to dissociative identity disorders, therapeutic practices in Brazilian medievalistic religions, discussing religious practices among the candomble, cardecismo, and dubanda of Brazil, as these practices relate to therapy for dissociative disorders. Dr. Kripner is an associated, uh, an associated distinguished professor at the California Institute of Integral Studies. He has received uh, the Lifetime Career Awards for his research in dream studies, humanistic psychology, and parapsychology. He is the recipient of the American Psychological Association's Award for Distinguished Contributions to the International Advancement of Psychology, among others. He is author of uh, countless of uh, books, book chapters, and articles. So without further ado, uh, Dr. Kripner, let's begin your presentation. Muchas gracias, Ramses. Usted es muy simpático. Gracias. I'm going to start by reminding people, if you don't already know it, that the term multiple personality is no longer used in psychology and psychology. Dissociative identity disorder is now the preferred term. Why? Because identity better explains what's happening than personality. Personality is a global term, but what happens in cases of DID is much narrower. And so with that background, we're going to start the PowerPoint. In 1840, the French physician Despina published a monograph describing his successful treatment of what he called dual personality in a young woman named Estelle. Despina claimed that Estelle's secondary personality directed her treatment with guidance from a benign spirit. Although this approach is not a vague among Western psychotherapists, it would not be considered unusual among the mediumistic healers of Brazil's three major spiritualistic sects, Candomblé, Cardicismo, and Umbanda. The first African slaves were brought to Brazil in about 1550 to work on plantations in the northeastern part of Portuguese colony. Many of them were appropriated, often with the complicity of avaricious people from their own tribes, from the West African coast, home of the Yoruba culture. Permeating the Yoruba belief system were stories about the spirits or Orishas, powerful and terrifying, but so human that they could be talked to, pleaded with, and cajoled by means of special offerings. The Orishas were part of the tradition brought to Brazil by the slaves. Upon their arrival, the slaves were baptized as Christians and forced to attend the Roman Catholic Mass. They were allowed to hold their own religious services, but encounter difficulty if the priest did not find pictures of Jesus, Mary, and the saints upon the slaves' altars. So it was that the slaves cleverly adopted the Christian saints and deities, combining them with their own Orishas. Oruun, God of creation, became God the Father, or Jehovah. Obatala, God of the heavens and the purity, became Jesus Christ. His daughter, Yamanja, became the Virgin Mary and her children became St. George, St. Sebastian, St. Catherine, and various other Christian saints. There was no direct counterpart for Satan in Yoruba mythology. The closest that could be derived were the mischievous Eshus, messengers of the God who sometimes mixed up people's prayers and granted them somebody else's request. The slaves were freed in 1888, not long after Brazil declared its independence from Portugal. Fifteen generations of Brazilians had heard the stories of the Orishas, of death by the evil eye, of illnesses cured, cured by spirit counsel, and of marriages saved by spirit intervention. In 1830, three black freedwomen bought an abandoned mill house to set up Brazil's first candomblé center. The three former slaves became mediums or mothers of the saints and their apprentices became daughters of the saints. This group resurrected and adapted the Yoruba traditions. 
using the original names of the Orishas and incorporating the spirits as they sang, danced, and beat their drums. They also learned about herbs and about the specialties and potions needed by the sick and infirm. In 1818, a group of mediumistic practitioners organized around the principles of homeopathy. Later, this group eagerly translated the book by Alan Kardec, a French teacher and spiritualist, which had been brought to Brazil from Europe in 1858. In it, they found a faith more sophisticated than Candomblé, which circumvented the drum beating and most of the Orishas. Yet, Cardecismo upheld the importance of incorporating spirit guides and healing services and religious ceremonies. Umbada was initiated in 1904. Its founders claimed to be in contact with an American Indian spirit guide who taught them how to purify the African rites. Some Umbadistas use dreams with drums and make sacrifices, but others do not. All, however, emphasize the importance of spirit incorporation. They all venerate Jesus Christ. In addition, Christian names typically are used for the saints rather than the African appellations. There are other mediumistic or spiritistic movements as well, but Candomblé, Carter Sismo, and Umbada are the three major syncretic groupings. Their ceremonies differ and the rituals vary, but they all hold several beliefs in common. Humans have a physical body and a spiritual body. Discarnate spirits are in constant contact with the physical world. Humans can learn how to incorporate spirit guides for the purposes of healing. In contemporary Brazil, the spiritistic healer may be a local medium, a hospital psychiatrist, or a clinical psychologist. Each would consider the possibility of spirit possession and or past life evocation as the explanatory principle of some, but if not most cases, of dissociative identity disorder, DID. In my several trips to Brazil, I've had the opportunity to observe many exorcism, healing sessions, and mediumistic seances. In addition, I've been interviewed spiritistic healers regarding their views of DID etiology and treatment. Although there is no uniformity of practice, spiritistic therapy may involve the exorcism of offending spirit personalities, the integration of intruding past life personalities into the client's behavioral repertoire, or a compromise in which some of these personalities retain their identity but emerge only on circumscribed occasions. The latter alternative is often utilized in the cases of clients who have been encouraged to undergo mediumistic training. Once they've become mediums, their other identities can be of assistance in their vocational duties. In the instance of DID, many spiritistic practitioners are of the opinion that this order can often be understood in terms of their clients' past lives. They believe that everyone's past lives are omnipresent, often exhibiting themselves as subpersonalities or emerging under special conditions such as illness and inebriation. For DID cases, however, many practitioners believe that a hypersensitivity exists often, but not always, triggered by traumatic childhood experiences. In an interview with me, one practitioner who calls himself an applied parapsychologist described the case he had treated that involved a 12-year-old girl who, at the onset of puberty, began to play boys' games in the street. At the same time, she started to exhibit a critical attitude toward her rapidly developing female physiology. He consulted a group of mediums he refers to as a super team because of their alleged proficiency in diagnosis. The super team reported that the client had been a male in the previous life and that this former identity had been evoked by the biological changes accompanying puberty. After about three months of therapy, the alleged alternate, alternate or alter male identity was merged with the host female identity. The girl's gender was accepted by what he refers to as the client's psychological center, a deep-seated aspect of the psyche underlying all identities, both hosts and alter. Many Western psychotherapists would consider this an example of gender dysphoria and would have treated her very differently. To diagnose a case of DID, this practitioner relied upon his super team of three mediums. 
They place the client in an altered state, typically through music and movement. While the client danced to the music, the super team attempted to contact the alter identities. As they did so, the client's movements, voice, and facial expressions are observed because they typically change from identity to identity. The super team recorded in writing its observations concerning each identity <coughs> that manifested itself. In the ID, he asserted each identity lives in its own apartment, but therapy encourages them all to enter the dining room. The emotional life of each alter is explored and compared with others. This comparison was made by clients themselves, by the therapists, by the mediums, and in a therapeutic community setting by other clients. In the case of people whose alters represent former lifetimes, the goal of therapy is a merging of identities by bringing them all into what he called the psychological center. This merging first occurs emotionally as linkages were formed between identities. One identity may have had emotional strengths that the other identities lack. The eventual synthesis could result in a fuller, more complex personality structure than what was early available for any of the identities. Clients are told that the rate of their integration is dependent upon their own efforts to affect the psychological synthesis of their various identities. However, if there is the intrusion of a malevolent identity from a past life or from another source, exorcism rather than merging is advised. The practitioner claimed that he followed the emotional aspect of his treatment with an instinctual approach. This next phase of the treatment was characterized by assisting the alter identity to express itself physically through deep breathing, exercise, massage, painting, dance, and dramatizations. Birthmarks and phobias of the host identity were thought to give clues as to his or her past lives. For example, a scar on the neck could represent death by beheading in a former life. A fear of swimming could be related to a fateful drowning. The final focuses of treatment were intellectual and spiritual, at which time all of a client's alter identities were addressed. Their concurrent needs were stated and compared. This laid the groundwork for a possible psychological synthesis of the identities. He felt that it was important that each of the alter identities manifested itself. In the therapeutic process, the weakest of the identities was the first to merge with the host identity. As the weaker identities disappeared, the stronger alters were given more attention. A medium works with a psychotherapist because the medium was often able to evoke the alter identity with more facility. It was his position that mediums tend to understand alter identities better than most psychotherapists. Integration is not desirable in all cases. If the alter identity represents someone else's former life, it may need to be expunged rather than merged, or it might be an alter identity of someone currently alive, such as a sorcerer. In these cases, exorcism also may be practiced. Again, a team of mediums knowledgeable in such procedures is usually used to dispel the intruding entity. He prefers the advantages offered by his therapeutic community to seeing clients individually. He finds dance therapy more effective when there are several participants because of the various reactions that occur. He refers to the large rooms where the dancing, dramatizations, and exercise sessions take place as the mad o drama rooms. Both the therapists and mediums are present during the group therapy sessions to facilitate the process, to channel the crises that occur, or, and to pay attention to the alter identities that become manifest. If a client's tradition deteriorates or is not improved, he or she is sent to one of the hospitals run by Brazilian spiritists. In these hospitals, there is an acceptance of the notion that the emergence of a past life identities and or possession by a discarded entity could produce dissociative disorders. In this setting, both individual and group therapy is practiced. Clients are again reminded that they're ultimately responsible for the rate of their own healing process. The average length of treatment is about three years for hospitalized clients. Case study. 
Sonia was an 18-year-old client from the city of Salvador de Bahia who could not establish long-term relationships with men. Her sexual behavior was characterized by a series of one-night stands in which she engaged in intercourse but could not achieve orgasm. Sometimes she was told that she had fought bitterly with these men, but she had no memory of the conflicts. One evening, three men arrived at the same time for a date, but Sonia only recalled accepting invitation from one of them. In despair, she unsuccessfully attempted suicide on several occasions. She went in and out of hospital where she was given electroconvulsive therapy and heavy doses of medication to no avail. She was referred by a friend. During her first interview with the super team, Sonia reportedly began to speak in French, a language she had never studied. A voice emanating from Sonia introduced herself as Violetta, one of Sonia's former lives. Violetta claimed that she had lived in the 18th century. Furthermore, she frankly stated that she wanted to kill Sonia because she would have more freedom if she could completely control Sonia's body. Violetta wanted to be more rather than less sexually promiscuous. It was Violetta who had fought with men who did not please her and who had accepted multiple dates only to embarrass Sonia. Further, Violetta stated that she attained orgasm easily and did not care whether Sonia was orgasmic or not. The goal of the therapy focused upon limiting the power of Violetta while attempting a psychological synthesis of the instinctual side of her personality with that of Sonia, whose instinctual aspects were poorly developed. Sonia was treated in this practitioner's office rather than the therapeutic community because she worked during the day. After six treatments, the host and all their identities allegedly had merged to the extent that Sonia was able to achieve orgasm. Sonia's intellectual abilities were further developed and sharpened to give her greater self-awareness and self-control. However, Another older personality from the 16th century emerged, that of Sarah, a Jewish housewife. At first, Sarah's appearance complicated the treatment, but it soon became evident that Sarah provided the emotional maturity that both Sonia and Violetta lacked. Sonia continued to be orgasmic and soon got married. Her husband began to attend the therapy sessions, learning how to communicate with both Violetta and Sarah. Another identity Chen manifested itself. A male entity, Chen was introduced by Sarah as the initiate of a Chinese spiritual discipline. Chen brought a spiritual tranquility into Sonia's life, just as he had supposedly performed the same functions for Sarah centuries earlier. Because Sarah had refused to renounce her Jewish face, the Spanish Inquisition had burned her at the stake as a witch. Indeed, shortly after Sarah's appearance, Sonia developed bodily spots that resembled small birds. Sonia also developed red rings on her wrist where Sarah claimed she had been tied to the stake. Sonia wanted to wear her new swimsuit to the beach, but feared that the birds had disfigured her. But Sarah said that the birds had served their purpose, correctly predicting that they would disappear in 48 hours. Sonia claimed to recall seeing all three of the altar identities when she was a child and considered them to be her spirit playmates. When she told her mother about them, she was scolded, told that she was crazy, and warned never to talk about them again. The recall of the childhood experiences appeared to accelerate Sonia's therapy. A merging took place after about 18 months of work, and the psychological synthesis reportedly was still intact three years later at the time of my visit. The practitioner commented that all three of the alter identities were intelligent entities, making the therapy much easier. When an alter is a child or a mentally challenged person, therapy becomes a more difficult process because of these entities' limited social maturity, speech, and intelligence. In the case of Sonia, however, two of the alter personalities represented Sonia's best lives, and the third was an entity known to one of them. According to the practitioner, when the altar is somebody else's past life or an obsessive spirit, therapy is considerably more time consuming. Spirit and corporation of possession are not solitary acts or isolated phenomena. They represent aspects of a particular worldview and are intrinsically linked to social structure, religious philosophy, and theories of health and illness. Conventional medical thinking in industrial societies is ethnocentric. 
viewing possession states and other alterations of consciousness as necessarily abnormal, if not pathological. Indeed, such terms as possession lack culture fee objective definitions. The anthropologist Erica Bergenon found more differences and similarity between PID cases and mediums of Latin American sex who voluntarily incorporate spirits. Indeed, spirit incorporation may be therapeutic in some cases, as it can release inhibition and provide a source of esteem for the medium as well as emotional catharsis for the group. She claimed that Latin American spiritists who practice spirit incorporation function better in society than their peers. This was especially to a woman whose role as mediums empowered them, giving them status and privilege in areas typically hostile to female leadership. It has even been suggested that the eclipse of concepts such as possession and exorcism was a factor in the rise of DID in industrialized nations. However, if the diagnosis of DID, the ideas reported to me are correct, this does not seem to be holding true in Brazil. The spiritistic concept of DID differs sharply from that of most psychiatrists and psychologists who assume that the client is a singular individual, albeit one whose peculiar defense structure manifests itself in personifications as plural parts of the self. Therapeutic techniques use techniques developed for group and family therapy with selected aspects of transactional analysis, gestalt psychology, behavior modification, and hypnotherapy. However, there have been minority points of view among psychologists and psychiatrists that more closely parallel the spiritistic viewpoint dating back to William James, who urged that the possession hypothesis be taken seriously. Van Dusen, in his practice of clinical psychology, discovered that he could communicate with his clients' apparent hallucinations by accepting them as objective realities. Most of these entities stated that they were attempting to possess the client so that they could act through the client whenever and whatever they pleased. But Van Dusen also encountered higher entities that respected the client's right to self-determination and attempted to be of assistance. Allison has observed this phenomenon of DID cases, referring to them as higher helpers. There's a case in the psychiatric literature of a preoperative transgender patient who visited a religiously oriented physician just before his sex reassignment surgery. The physician announced that the client was possessed by 22 spirits and performed an exorcism. After some additional sessions of a faith healer, the client regains his male identity and had not regressed when followed up two years later. The case report concluded that this patient, who is clearly a transgender level, by the most conservative criteria, assumed a long-lasting masculine gender identity in a remarkably short period of time following the apparent exorcism. Crabtree, in his psychotherapy practice, has dealt with cases in which the concept of possession appears to him to be the most parsimonious explanation of the observed phenomena. For him, possession is the creation of an identity within an individual by a self other than that of the individual, whereas DID involves the emergence of identity created within the psyche. Such standard DID phenomena is switching from one identity to another. The ignorance of the host identity often has of alters, and the knowledge that all their speakers will have of each other have been observed by spiritistic practitioners as well. It can be seen that Brazilian spiritists both agree with and differ from the concepts of DID held by most academic and medical psychotherapists. However, these differences should serve as a reminder that the notion of the individual self should not be taken for granted. Conceptions of the self are cultural products Ideas about one's own self are acquired by individuals in a social context. Most native people live in a matrix of social and kinship relationship. That seems little room for a concept of an isolated self. Their worldview often holds that an individual does not exist except as reflected by other people. As a result, each person consists of many selves. The self perceived by one's parents the self perceived by co residents of a household, and the self perceived by members of various social groups. 
this multiple self is created, defined, and systematically transformed by various aspects of one society. The Huna tradition of Polynesia holds that there are seven selves, a high, middle, and lower self, each with a sheath or covering, and a transcendent self. Among the Kuna Indians in Panama, there's a notion that eight selves, in this instance, each self is associated with a different portion of the body, and each person is ruled by one of these aspects. A problem occurs when one self attain gaze ascendancy, either temporarily or for a longer period of time. A person governed by the head center is typically intellectual. But if the hand center takes over, that individual may begin fighting or stealing because the head center, the hand center does not know how to use its newly attained power wisely. It appears that the human being is extremely malleable. People can engage in role playing, in fantasy enactment, or dissociative behavior to create identities as required to defend themselves against trauma, to conform to cultural pressures, or to meet the expectations of a psychotherapist, medium, or exorcist. This malleability has both adaptive and maladaptive aspects. One of the beneficial results of renewed interest in the ID in the associative state is to illustrate the urgent need for more information in these areas and to illustrate the important role that cross-cultural research can play in this quest. Muchas gracias, muito obrigado.